So anyway, so we're going to talk about, um, you'll see how this ties into what we're talking about today. So as we know, the pace of our world moves so fast now, and it can be difficult to appreciate just how big a task some things would have been in the past. So let's consider con some construction projects. And Dylan, if you want to go ahead and just, yeah. All right, so the Empire State Building in New York in the States, this thing was built back in like 1930, but it only took them a year and 45 days, which is really impressive, actually. That surprised me. Now, if you go to the next one, does anyone know what building this is? It's in Dubai. It's in Dubai. It is the Burj Khalifa, and it is the tallest building in the world. And the actual construction phase of it took about six years. That's it. Tallest building in the world. It's like 163 story, stories or something. Now, bringing it a little more local, not quite as impressive, but that's Queen's Ferry Crossing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the construction phase of this itself took about five to six years. I think it felt like longer when they were building it. But, I mean, it might not be quite as impressive as the tallest building in the world, but still, you think that to build that whole stretch in such a short amount of time, that's actually quite impressive. Now, if we compare it to some older buildings, some more ancient ones, keep, up, keep the slide going there. This is the Notre Dame Cathedral in uh, Paris. And this took 182 years to build. A little closer to home, we go to the next one, York Minister, down in England. Very impressive structure, but it took 252 years. And this one, the next one, the Great Wall of China took approximately 2,000 years to build. Wow. It was not uncommon for hundreds, probably thousands, to give their whole lives building something, knowing that they weren't going to see the end of that project. They would die before it was ever completed, and other generations would take it on and continue it. So in today's lesson, we look at one of the most significant construction projects in history or sorry, not in history, in scripture. The actual building of it was only seven years, so it was impressively fast for the time. But the whole process, planning, gathering materials, all of that spanned two generations. And it is Solomon's time. And it was called that because Solomon was the one on the throne during the construction of it. But it was only possible to be completed in such a short amount of time because of David's investment of his time, his finance, and his planning. So it might have not been built if David had not been committed to something that he personally would never see. He didn't get to see the dedication. He didn't get to see the people coming there to worship. He just had a dream. And we all need to be investing in things that will outlive us. And there's a lot of things. You think about the things that we invest our time in and everything. And you think about which ones are going to outlive us which ones aren't. And we must be willing to give our time, our talent, and our treasure to kingdom projects that may or may not yield results in our lives. We won't always see the things that you guys are doing as leaders. You know, you might not see the results of that, especially as fast as you want to. You know, you want to see everybody get behind it and it, it succeed and it grow and it blow up. And that's not always the case. But we're looking at this from that long-term perspective. We're investing into even future generations. And no worker <coughs> is more important than another. Doesn't matter whether you're the one who puts the first nail in or whether you put the last nail in. Each one is building on the work of others. Mm -hmm. And it really is often challenging to keep that big picture in mind. Because we get so, well, at least I get bogged down in the particulars, the details of a task. Okay, I have to do this, I have to do this, this needs to be done by this time, you know, there's a deadline here. And you get so you know, focused on, okay, on this individual thing that needs done, and it can be easy to lose sight of the big picture of what we're doing. And so David and Solomon's story really teaches us important lessons about how, how we can build on what others have done and, and work together, but it's always God that gets the glory. Mm -hmm. We do our part, but it's God that gets the glory. Right. First Corinthians 3 and 6, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So David's desire to honor God. Anyone who studies David's life 
you'll notice there's a big contrast. He's got some high moments, some good moments. Mm -hmm. He's got some really, really low moments. He was, we see his integrity in that he was unwilling to home, harm King Saul, even though his own life was in danger because Saul was hunting him down. But then we see on another occasion that because Nabal refuses him hospitality and is rude to him, that he's ready to kill Nabal, kill his entire house, burn it to the ground. You know, he's, we see that flash of anger coming through. And so we see the, the contrast there. So he did have, and then of course, you know, we think of Uriah, getting Uriah killed, adultery with Bathsheba. But yet God testified him, even though he had those low, low moments, God said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. What an amazing thing to have said. I, I, was, I like that. I always th think about that. You know, I want that to be said of me. I don't, I don't, not, I'm not there yet, but I want God to say, that's a woman after my heart. Mm -hmm. You see, consistent, what was consistent through David's life was he wanted to honor God. In those high moments, we really see it, but even in the low moments, in his response to them, we see him coming back to the Lord. We see him coming back to that focus that he just wanted to give God the glory. He wanted to worship with his life, not only with his songs. So discussion question here. What does it mean to you to honor God in your life? What does that mean? Honor, honoring a God, that can be very like abstract. What does that actually look like in your life? What does that mean for you? Giving up my time. Okay. Uh, everything. Everything? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's hard to add to that, I suppose. It's one of those things just to think about, because it's one of those things that we know. Yeah, to honor God. Yes, he's to get the glory. But what does that mean for me? You know, how do I honor God with my life? So it's just maybe something to think about. So we know that David had a desire to build a house for the Lord, something that would outlast him and his reign. So near his death, David calls Solomon to him, and we find it First Chronicles 22 and 7. He says, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. See, when David traveled to Shiloh to visit the tabernacle, he was visiting, I mean, the tabernacle that the Israelites had carried with them in the wilderness, it was basically a tent. That's what it was. It was a very beautiful tent, but it was a tent. It was a temporary thing that was to be taken up and down. So it's here in Shiloh, it has kind of a permanent home. But it's a temporary building. And David's going from his palace, you know, he's got, he, he's pretty rich, you know, he's got gold and silver and diamonds, and he's going from his house that's all furnished beautifully to the house of the Lord, which is in a tent. And he begins to feel convicted about that. Because that's, that's not right. God should be the one that has the best. Not, not David, not the king of the land. So what about God's house? And so there's two things to note about David's desire, like two good things that we can take from it. One, he wanted to give God his best and nothing less. And the second thing is he wanted to build it not so people would look at him, not for his own fame, but unto the name of the Lord. And anything we do for God, it has to be with that motive. So that God gets the glory. That's 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 the foundation, be all, end it all of everything. If people completely forget wow. about us, if the Lord tarries, and you know, 50 years from now, 60 years from now, you know, there's a, the church in Edinburgh is thriving. It's got those 50 churches, you know, with a thousand each, all that. So if they forget that we were ever a part of it, so be it. So be it. Because it's about God getting the glory. So the Lord promised to build a house for David. The thing about God is he'll never be in our debt. He'll never owe us right. anything. There's no sacrifice that we can give that he's, he's got to, you know, that he, he can't repay. No sacrifice for him goes unnoticed. So David, although he was not allowed to complete this project, the Lord blessed him, not for what he did necessarily, but for the desire of his heart, because that desire was correct. Mm -hmm. That was a good desire, a good dream to have. So 2 Samuel 7, 11, uh, the prophet told David, Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. Amen. 
And we know that this was fulfilled not only in the kings that sat on Judah, all being from David's lineage, but in Jesus Christ, who sits on the throne forever, being a son of David. So forever, David had one of his descendants sitting on the throne. So it leads us to this principle, which is always true, is that God will do more for us than we can do for him. The benefits of serving in the kingdom cannot be compared with, oh, what we might have to give up, our devotion, what it costs us. You, you can't balance those and say, oh, well, they're kind of equal. No, it's always going to be God's side weighted down so much more. First Chronicles, um, well, no, we'll come to that one later. So there's two things here. First of all, it's difficult to look at Calvary. When we really look at Calvary, it's difficult to compare that and then look at what we do and the price that we might pay for our service in the kingdom of God and say that we're sacrificing. When we are not looking at Calvary and we're just looking at our own lives, it's, I mean, yeah, it's easy to say, well, you know what, it's, it's really tough to get up early on Sunday morning and, you know, and to come and serve, not just, to, but to come and serve in the kingdom of God. You know, that can be tough. And we can look at, oh, it's a sacrifice. We have to go here and do this and all that stuff. But then when we begin to look at Calvary, it's awful hard to say I'm sacrificing. Mm -hmm. what do I, how can I say that when I look at what he gave to us? It, does, it pales in comparison. <clears throat> and the second thing is that the daily benefit of kingdom service, it eclipses, it overshadows whatever price tag serving in the kingdom might have. There is a cost. Jesus told us to count that cost. Mm -hmm. But God always gives more. And sometimes when we're getting tired and weary, which we all do, we've got to take that step back. We've got to look at Calvary, but we've also got to recognize the blessings of God in our lives. Mm -hmm. And especially the blessings that have come because of us serving. Mm -hmm. Because there's always blessings. Mm -hmm. David wanted to build a temple house, a house made with hands mm -hmm. for the Lord. But God promised him an eternal house. He gave him so much more. And we have a similar promise in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. It says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, our bodies, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You can't beat that. No matter what we give up, no matter what we sacrifice, we, we can't compare to that. So it's worth it. And there's a question here to maybe think about as well. So, although we know that God will reward us when we give, when we sacrifice, when we do those things, we don't want to do it just for a reward. That's not the point. Because again, what is the motive? It's for the name of the Lord to be glorified. So how can we avoid the danger of corrupting our motives by giving just in order to see God give back? How can we make sure that we avoid that in our lives? One thing I know that sin separated us from the means of love. So there's one thing that we know that doesn't separate the means of love. We can take on our own. Also, I just feel righteous. to note, this was not a punishment. Mm -hmm. 
This was not punishing David for the wars that he had fought and the blood on his hands because those battles were not fought outside of God's approval and blessing. God had said, go, I'll be with you. God intervened miraculously for him. It was a part of God's plan for David to be that warrior for the kingdom of Israel. Just because the Lord says no to something that we might have as a desire of our heart, it doesn't mean necessarily that he's displeased with us. Mm -hmm. It might be that he just has a little bit different of a plan. Mm -hmm. He has different pursuits. Maybe that's his plan for somebody else, and we can be a part of supporting that. So David gathered the laborers and the materials. So his response is something really just key to learn from. Because the common fleshly reaction when somebody says no, when it's something that really matters to us, that's really important to us, is to get upset. That's what we do. We get upset, right? And then there's that pride that could creep in. Well, why, why should somebody else get to build and get the credit for what's my idea? It was my dream to build a temple. I wanted to do that for God. And, you know, there's there could be this temptation to say, well, I'm not going to be a part of it at all then. If I don't get to be the one who builds it, then so be it. I'll just, whatever. Do it your way, God. You know, and I get sulky about it. But David didn't do that. Rather than pout about what he couldn't do, he focused on what he could do. And he gathered the needed materials and resources. Somebody, anybody have a Bible? If someone wants to get Brother Clay, if you want to get 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 2 to 5. Gathering the materials, it wasn't a small thing. It was quite a bit. Chapter 22, and then read verses 2 through 5. sure that it's it's the best for him you know he's not got a lot of experience with this so I'm gonna I'm gonna add what I can add to it so before his death David charged Solomon to complete the work David was intentional intentional about communicating the vision he wasn't gonna leave it to chance well maybe Solomon will decide to do it maybe he won't he was very he charged him first Chronicles 22 and 6 then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build and house for the Lord God of Israel. If you don't do anything else, Solomon, do this. This is what you are to do. So it was not merely David's idea as well, but it was that the Lord had selected Solomon, and that was communicated to him. And we must also intentionally communicate what God has put in our heart to the next generation. It doesn't happen by accident or chance. Visions and dreams don't get passed on just by, you know, randomness. It has to be intentional. It takes an elder with a willingness to speak and a successor with a willingness to hear. I mean, we can look at our own church, for example. You know, you guys were here from the start, but Brother B, he spoke this vision of 50 churches, mm -hmm. 1,000 each, a tithe of the people to be in an apostolic church. But he spoke that ever so often. Because it, it doesn't just happen, you know, okay, this is what we're going to do, and then everybody does their own thing. Everybody has to be on that same page. And so it takes speaking it and repeating it 
and repeating it. It's like, and when we're promoting events, the same thing, you know? We want people to get behind it, but it doesn't just happen, but hope they show up. You know, it's, it's gotta be, okay, this is why we're doing this, and then repeat and repeat and repeat. Because we're people, all of us. We don't always get it the first time around. We don't always catch it. But, but David communicated that vision. And like I said, we see that in our own church. You know, we, in our phase that our church is in now, you know, we've been prepared. We've been charged like David charged Solomon, you know, let's build it, let's build it, let's build it. That's why we need to, to structure for growth and prepare for growth because it's going to happen as we communicate the vision and as we work together to it. Being a good steward honors God. Each of us is charged by God's word to be a good and wise steward. It is, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. That stewardship encompasses all areas of our life. You know, our time, how we steward our time, how we manage our time. Our talents, how we use them. Our finances, that's the obvious one. Our relationships, but also our vision. And that's one we don't often think about. But how do we manage the dreams that God has put in our heart? I feel like this is a really important question because it's one thing to have this far off dream and kind of keep it in the back, but how are we working towards it? How are we preparing for it? How are we preparing ourselves for it sometimes is the question. Are we committed to that vision and that mission even if it means supporting someone else for success and not us being the top dog? Are we purposeful about sharing our vision so that others can buy into that and share the passion? David was intentional in his purpose and preparation. He was a wise steward, a really good example of a wise steward. So then Solomon built the temple. Next slide. Solomon built the temple. It bears his name. It's called Solomon's temple. Oh, whatever. It's called Solomon's temple because he's the one that built it. David didn't get his name on it. But we know it was possible because of what he put into it as well. But Solomon had to accept David's charge. It couldn't just stop with David doing all the preparation and all of those things and giving the vision. Someone had to receive it and run with it. Before any builders had hired, it started with Solomon embracing the vision that had been passed down from his father. It had to become his own. We can look at it this way, you know, we have individual dreams and we have individual passions, but we also are working together as a church to see the city of Edinburgh you know, filled with the gospel. And so that church vision also has to become our own personal vision. If you don't have a vision, you can adopt one. You know, it's as we see Solomon did. And if we read Solomon's words to Hiram, the king of Tyre, 1 Kings chapter, I'm just going to turn to that quickly. 1 Kings chapter 5 and verse 5. I had my pen in there, so that's convenient. It says, Behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. That first part of that verse, you know, he explains how he got that vision, but he said, I propose, I purpose to build a house for the name of the Lord. Now, normally, we try to avoid those I statements. We say, you know, it's, don't be self-centered, you know, it's not all about you. But there is time where it has to become I, me. I have a part to play. I am going to do this for the Lord because it has to become personal. And so he accepted this assignment as God's will for him. It became personal. I will do. This is what, now our part of this, how we apply this. I will do what God calls me to do. Each of us, we have a purpose in God's kingdom. And we've got to embrace it. It might be cutting down the trees. It might be gathering the materials. It might be hammering the actual nails. You know, there's... You might be the one in charge of it all. The task is up to God to decide. But in ours is the willingness to say, Lord, I'm going to do your will. Whatever that looks like for me. Whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. No matter how long it takes or what it costs. Now, you know the Sunday school song, Building Up the Temple? Yeah. Yeah, we used to sing it. We used to sing it when we took up the Sunday school offering. That's the, we're going to sing that. Building up the temple, building up the temple, building up the temple for the Lord. Saying, girls, won't you help us? Boys, won't you help us? 
building up the temple of the Lord. See, I like Sunday school songs. Because we might be adults, but they still hold pretty true. Because that's what we're doing. We're building up the temple. And it takes everybody. You know, won't you help us? Won't you join in? The boys, the girls, the men, the women, whatever. we got to build up the temple. So let me end off with this. If you go to the last, well, one before that. So this book here, I haven't read it, but I was reading some of the stuff in it, and it's really interesting. Alan Fadling's book, called An Unhurried Life, it tells a modern parable of a king and two servants. And this really, really got me, all right? Both of them had a desire to please the king, but they had two very different approaches. So servant one, I see a little bit of myself in servant one, and this convicted me. Because servant one, he was so eager to please, to please the king that he was like, okay, I'm gonna get up early. I'm gonna have a list of all the things that I think the king's gonna want done today. And I'm just gonna put myself heart and soul into getting all of those things done. So he would rise up early and he, he wouldn't even bother the king. You know, he would, he would just, okay, I'm gonna get this done. I'm gonna get this done. And he would scurry from project to project thinking, okay, I'm gonna please the king by being involved in all of these different things. And you can kind of see how that would go because we, when we burn the candle at both ends, so to speak, you know, we can get worn out and weary too. Servant two had a very different approach. He did get up early as well, but he, he had a slower start. The first thing that he would do is he would sit down with the king and he would ask the king what his list looked like. What do you want me to accomplish today? What do you need done today? And then only after that conversation with the king would he go and he would begin his work. Now servant one started faster, probably got more done, at least in the morning. But the question is this, which one was doing the king's will and pleasing the king? Which one was doing the king's will? It would be the one that took time to ask what the king's will was, not just assumed it and tried to fit as much in. And the author of the book says this, genuine productivity is not about getting as much done for God as we can manage. It is about doing the good work God actually has for us in a given day. That's how doing God's will starts. Not frantically trying to fit as much in as we can. But saying, Lord, what's your will for me today? How can I do what you want me to do today? So God's timing and purposes are perfect. But in order to know what it looks like in our lives, we have to give from him. We have to be in tune with him. We have to have that relationship with him so that we can hear the voice of the spirit. We can hear his word as he speaks to us. And then it's our job, in turn, when we hear God's will, to just give our all to wherever he's directed us at that time. So Solomon's willingness to receive direction and fulfill it should challenge us. Go to the last slide there, Dylan. So these questions here, we're going to pray about them in just a second. What has God spoken to you about? What is your vision and your passion? Where can you invest your time and your talent? What does the local church need? I know everybody that's currently here is, is already very involved. This is the last thing, is have you asked the king? Have you asked the king? And that, to me, is kind of the, the one that jumps out at me. What does he want me to do in this time and in this season? What does he want me to focus my time and attention on? Solomon's temple was one of the great construction accomplishments of the time. But your ministry also can impact our world and generations to come. We're going to catch the vision, do whatever we can, and most importantly, do whatever he asks us. So we're just going to stand and we're going to close in prayer, but we're going to pray about these questions specifically, that the Lord would, not necessarily right now, maybe, but just in the next couple weeks or so, that maybe he'd speak to us about some of these things. Lord, we thank you for your word and the example that we have in your word of David and Solomon, Lord, and how we see that vision being passed on and how we see them working in the various roles that you had appointed them to do, Lord, to see your kingdom be established, to see your temple be built. Lord, and we're building up this spiritual temple in your kingdom, God. We're wanting to do 
our part, Lord. We have a desire, my God, to please you, Lord, and to be a part of what you are doing in this time, in this place. Lord, I pray, Jesus, that you would speak to us, God. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Let our ears be open to hear, God, the, the leading of your spirit, God, so that we're not just running around frantically trying to do it our way, but, Lord, we're hearing from you, God. What is it that you want us to do? God, how can we put our hands to the plow? God, how can we hammer the nails in your kingdom? How can we do the part that you have called us to do, God? What does that look like for us, God? I pray you would speak to each one of us. Lord, give us clarity, God, not just as a church, having that church vision of what we're trying to accomplish as you lead us, but God, individually, Lord, a vision for each and every one of our lives, Lord. What do you want us to do? What is our role in the kingdom? What is you calling us to do? at this specific time, this specific season in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would help us. Help us to hear your voice, God, that we might do your will, and ultimately that we might glorify you, God. Cleanse us of every other motive, anything else that would try to creep in and, and defile that, Lord. Let our lives be about pleasing you and bringing you the glory, and we'll be happy with that, Lord. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you for everything else that you're going to do in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. God bless you guys.